Warm greetings to you all in the name and spirit of the risen Christ, and welcome to this opening convocation for United Theological Seminary's 144th year. Thanks be to God. It is a joy to be here with you and to recognize that you have come from near and far, and it is truly a privilege to be here with you and to worship God together. It is my privilege to introduce to you Mr. Jim Tharp, Chair of the Board of Trustees of United Theological Seminary, who will bring a greeting on behalf of our Board of Trustees. Thank you, Wendy. Yes, there is a Board of Trustees. And uh, I bring greetings from them. I have been on, the, this is my sixth year on the board, and I am the chair of the board for the academic and fiscal year that we're in right now. But as I said, we bring greetings, and we ask God's speed upon all of you. Thank you. Will you join me in thanking Jim and the board for their quiet, faithful support? We are so grateful to Christ United Methodist Church for their warm hospitality on this special occasion. Pastor Mark Damschroeder will bring a greeting on behalf of the church. Will you please join me in greeting him? Good morning, I'm Mark Damshore, I'm the executive pastor here, and on behalf of all of the Christ Church family, we welcome you. We have come to define our mission here at Christ Church as being a place where, where lives are changed through the transforming power of Christ. And so our hope and prayer is that perhaps maybe in the two days that you're here, the transforming power of the Holy Spirit can be felt, felt here, and maybe your lives are just changed, just even maybe the slightest as, as, you find your, as you spend your time here with us today. And if you need anything, seek one of us out. We're all around. We have custodial staff around. We're down in the offices. Seek us out, and we'll do everything we can to help you out and get you whatever you need. But enjoy your time together. Thank you, Mark. Now, as we gather to ask God's blessing upon this new academic year, let us recall our sins in the past and ask God's forgiveness and aid for all the days to come. Lord Jesus Christ, you are word made flesh. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to lead us into truth. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, you will come to raise us to glory. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy upon us, forgive us all our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. We perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The reading from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning presents us with two scenes from the drama of the life of Joseph as described in the book of Genesis. In the first scene, Joseph is now an important governor in Egypt and having been sold there as a slave by his brothers. His brothers have come to Egypt to buy food because there is a great famine in their own land. They do not know that the great prince before them is in fact their brother. This scene from Genesis 45 verses 4 through 8 reads this way. Joseph said to his brothers, come forward to me. And when they came forward to him, they, he said, I am your brother Joseph, he whom you sold into Egypt. Do not be distressed or reproach yourselves because you sold me hither. It was to save life that God sent me ahead of you. It is now two years that there has been famine in the land and there are still five years to come in which there shall be no yield from tilling. God has sent me ahead of you to ensure the survival on earth and to save your lives in an extraordinary deliverance. So it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh, Lord of all his household and ruler over the whole land of Egypt. In the second scene, Joseph's family has settled in Egypt where they have prospered greatly. But then Joseph's father dies, and his brothers are now fearful that he will seek revenge upon them. The second scene in Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21, is described this way. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrong that we did to him? So they sent this message to Joseph. Before his death, your father left this instruction. So you shall say to Joseph, forgive, I urge you, the offense and guilt of your brothers who treated you so harshly. Therefore, please forgive the offense of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph was in tears as they spoke to him. His brothers went to him themselves, flung themselves before him and said, we are prepared to be your slaves. But Joseph said to them, have no fear. Am I a substitute for God? Besides, this is a very important verse in this passage. Besides, although you intended me harm, God intended it for good, so as to bring about the present result, the survival of many people. And so fear not, I will sustain you and your children. Thus he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. Here ends the lesson. Please turn to page 757 in your hymnal where you'll find Psalm 25.
I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Let none that wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are clothed with treachery. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, or the transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore the Lord instructs sinners in the way and leads the humble in what is right and teaches them their way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep the Lord's covenant and testimonies. I invite you to stand for a telling of the gospel. From the Gospel of Luke. Then Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons. The younger son came to his father and said, Father, please give me the share of your property that will belong to me. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son took all that he had and traveled to a distant country where he squandered his property in dissolute living. Well, after he had spent everything that he had, a severe famine came throughout the entire country and he began to be in want. No one would give him anything. So he hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. After he came to himself, he said, Oh, I would gladly fill my stomach with the pods that these pigs are eating. How is it that my father's servants have bread to eat and more to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. Then he said, I will get up and I'll go to my father and I'll say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired hands. So he got up and he went to his father. And while he was still far off, his father saw him at a distance. He was filled with compassion. He ran to him and put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. The father stopped him right there and said to his servants, Go, get one of my robes, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Go get the fatted calf and kill it, for we will eat and celebrate. 
Oh, for this son of mine was dead and is now alive. He was lost, and now he is found. And then they began to celebrate. Thanks be to God. You see it is. Friends, it's my privilege this morning to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Emma Justice. Dr. I heard a yay out there somewhere. Doctor, <laughs> you're off to a good start. <laughs> Dr. Justice is uh, the Distinguished Professor of Pastoral Care and Counseling in the Emma Toussaint Chair. She holds a BA from Franklin College, an MDiv from Colgate Rochester, a Master of Theology from Princeton Theological Seminary, and a PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary. She has also received an honorary doctorate from Franklin College. She's the author of two books, one, Hearing Beyond Words, and the other, Please Don't Tell. Uh, Please Don't Tell was actually recently featured as the cover story you may have seen on Circuit Rider magazine. So, um, uh, Dr. Justice, congratulations on the publication of your new book and also on its being featured in one of our United Methodist magazines. Dr. Justice is a very popular teacher. And if you don't know why, uh, that's probably because you've never taken a class from her. So uh, you soon will know why. Uh, it is uh, a privilege to have you as our speaker, Dr. Justice. We're looking forward to learning from you and to receiving bread from the Lord. Thank you for being our speaker today. Please join in welcoming Dr. Emma Justice. this a little bit. President Dykeman, Dean Watson, colleagues, students, friends, family. Um, I am uh, honored to be able to do this talk with you uh, on this opening convocation for the year. It was a blessing of a sabbatical that United granted me a couple of years ago now that uh, has allowed me to follow up on this long-term interest I have in secrets. And you may think the title of the book, Please Don't Tell, is working against secrets, but I hope you have another idea about that as we continue. I'm so thankful for that gift from, from United, for being able to do the, the work I needed to do. My deepest concern in all the work I do is to make it possible for people in congregations to receive better care from those in ministry and from one another. I also care about the well-being of all who do ministry, both lay and clergy. These two factors greatly influence my interest in the study of secrets. I welcome uh, your response to what I'm saying today. Uh, after the service, um, <laughs> because I consider work I do always work in process. And when I engage in conversations with any of you, it helps to improve what I am doing next. I believe we're all here because of our commitments to ministry and to the life of the church. And at the same time, we recognize that churches are engaged in struggles over many things. I want to begin with this, this affirmation. I have faith that healing can take place and that renewal is within our grasp. We can help to bring about healing and lessen suffering whenever we choose to do so. I'm thinking of Mark 14.7. Uh, this is similar a phrase in, in a similar passage in uh, several Gospels. And Jesus is responding to the people who are disparaging the woman 
who use the costly ointment to anoint Jesus. They're complaining that that money could have been given to the poor. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jesus responds, for you always have the poor with you. People like to stop there. And you can show them kindness whenever you wish. We can help to bring about healing and lessen suffering whenever we choose to. I do not mean to imply that there could ever be a pain-free, trouble-free existence for communities or for individuals. But we can do a great deal more to diminish the pain we store up in ourselves and the pain we inflict on one another because of the secrets we carry. We see many secrets around us at talk shows, if anyone watches any of that. Um, mysteries, mysteries wouldn't be mysteries without secrets. Uh, soap operas, tabloid reported lives of famous people, families, churches, schools, companies, countries, all keep secrets. In addition, people of all ages and groups of all sizes keep secrets that are shameful. Secrets that are kept about the identities of people. You don't know who I am. Uh, things people who have done, things done to them, or even things they have seen done to others. Uh, things that the secret keeper did not cause and for which they should never be blamed. And yet, many blame themselves for these secrets that they keep as burdens of shame. We also discover secrets in scripture. Now, are you ready for a quiz? All right. Uh, I'm serious, I'm serious. The question, how far do you have to go in scripture before you run into a secret? Genesis 3, I heard someone say. You can read two chapters without a secret. Okay. And there, they, it follows through throughout scripture. But in Genesis uh, 3, we find uh, Adam and Eve. Uh, They've eaten the forbidden fruit. They hear God coming and they hide. They do not want God to know what they have done. And even before God arrives, they have already experienced shame and sewn loincloths from fig leaves. Now I have to stop for a second. Where did they learn to sew? <laughs> in, in shame they hide from God. And this is only the beginning. Right with the secret Adam and Eve sought to keep from God, we recognize our common human experience of shame. They did not want God to know what they had done. They knew what they had done was wrong. Their actions were exactly what God had told them not to do. We have no familiarity with that. Created in God's image, they now believe that their very selves were flawed, which is exactly what shame tells us today about ourselves. Secret keepers carry secrets with shame and fear of being discovered and exposed. Even knowing we are created in God's image, shame holds the power to keep us from being all that God created us to be. Shame is a big deal. We see that it has been part of humanity from the very beginning. It keeps many people in bondage and working hard to keep the secret hidden. It is not a simple thing to do. Shame causes us to become fearful and keeps us from seeing our own worth and from participating fully in community. We got so much work to do with the secret we can't give everything that we have been given in our work for, the, for God. I'm concerned about people who hold secrets with shame, not secrets that are simply matters of privacy. That's, that's not hurting people when we have things that are private. Secrets um, are, that, but secrets that are burdens held with fear. Secrets sometimes carried for years and even decades. Shame-filled secrets require constant focus and energy to keep them concealed. And I'm concerned about churches 
where secrets have been held until they have burned holes in the hands of the church and the church can no longer reach out to people. In ministry, we must be available to deal with the shame people carry and neither avoid it nor add to it. We may think that's our job to add to the shame people carry. People don't always do what's right, and we know that, and they know that. Um, they know that we know it. In contrast, we do not want people to live without shame because to, li to be shameless means we are not good participants in community. We behave in ways that, uh, that discount others and ourselves. And a balance of some shame is good, good for community and good for individuals. We want a negative and positive to be absolutely clearly divided, but uh, shame is negative, but it also can be positive. Living shamelessly is not healthy. So I'm going to invite you to enter into this uh, presentation as you imagine being in your community of faith. You have permission to leave the room in your imagination. Uh, if you are a pastor, you might view the people from the pulpit. So look around in your mind. You know some of them better than others. For some of you, the people you see may be new to you since you are new to the disappointment. For those newer in their communities of faith, what you have so far may be limited first impressions. What is it that you don't know? What undercurrents are flowing in this place among these people who are at this time your people? What are the needs of the people you face? How do you feel about even raising these questions? Getting too close? But we can go further. What shameful secrets do they carry? And I'm, I'm ready to give guarantees about this. That, you know, within a congregation, I would say almost everyone will have a secret that is shameful, that they have kept to themselves. Or maybe some of them have had people to share them with. These questions are relevant for those in ministry who've been with their current church communities for a number of years. You still may not know the people, what's underneath the surface. I promise you there is a lot flowing on in church communities that is unseen from the surface. What we see is truly not everything we get. I want to offer an experiential illustration. When a par parishioner comes to us in a time of crisis, we may know what the crisis is, but that is only what is on the surface. We may know uh, in speaking with them further, we discover much more that troubles them. But when we become too afraid to wade in deeper with them, and then we have to find a way to stop them from going any further. Let's look at that. Maybe we think we should not go there, even as they lead the way, and instead we leave them. Our own fears and shame can keep us from making our listening available to those who carry painful secrets. We are not at all sure how much we want to hear, sometimes because of secrets we carry ourselves. What we hear from another person has the ability to touch my sore spot, what is bothering me, what I'm sh ashamed of and hiding. Even maybe something that I don't know is there. Any avoidance we may engage in gets support from both, both church and society. We keep it to yourself. <laughs> um, we should be nice and neither notice nor respond to those things that carry bits of ugly with them. My hope is that all of us will be able to listen to people who carry secret burdens and help them move toward healing and wholeness. On the way, however, it may make us uncomfortable. 
Perhaps we are called to listen through discomfort, to do ministry through discomfort, through awareness that we are not conforming to being nice. Like when we, it may mean contributing to freeing someone from, a, from living in brokenness. I see Jesus unexpectedly stopping with, he's surrounded by a crowd moving into Jericho. And so he's, he's the center of this. And he stops and he looks up in the sycamore tree and says to Zacchaeus to come down. Now he's interrupted the flow of what's going on there and what people are expecting to do something so unexpected because Zacchaeus is the lowest of the low to the people who are surrounding Jesus. And uh, he then continues to invite himself to Zacchaeus' house. And you know the grumbling that goes on following that. Zacchaeus, uh, Jesus does not preach to Zacchaeus, but Zacchaeus is still transformed. Because only moments later he's saying, I will give what I've stolen from people. I will, give, I will double it. I will quadruple it. Uh, and we see the transformation in him. At times we feel ill-equipped to go deeper with people. And I suspect that too many of us underestimate our abilities to be able to hear someone. We think we have to have answers and solutions. But truly being heard goes a long way toward healing for many people. Our questions about what we should avoid can be just as active when we choose scripture to read as it is in interacting with one another. One place where we meet, miss, and avoid secrets is in scripture. Uh, the lectionary is very compatible there for us because it manages to avoid scriptures we don't want to hear and don't want to read, don't want to preach about. Um, maybe Maybe this is one of them. The story of David's daughter, Tamar, found in 2 Samuel. It's a good illustration of scripture that includes a dynamic of a shameful secret. It's a story we may want to avoid. It talks about rape, first of all. Tamar was raped by her brother, Amnon, and she left his place crying aloud. Her brother, Absalom, told her to keep quiet about it. David later found out about the rape and neither father, David, nor brother, Absalom, did anything about it for some time. In addition to experiencing the horror of rape by her brother, Tamar is expected to keep it a secret. 2 Samuel 13, 20 makes the outcome plain. So Tamar remained a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. Her life was severely limited, not only by what was done to her, but also by the expectation that she be silent about it and basically no longer have a life. The impact of the rape, though destructive enough at the hands of her brother, was magnified by the demand that she keep it secret. A pattern followed even today. I want to guarantee that there are Tamars in most churches. Scripture gives us a variety of secrets with very different outcomes, and we have seen the secret of Adam and Eve, and we know how it turned out. Then we see Tamar's lifelong desolation. Next, we're considering Joseph, who reveals the secret that, uh, that had long been kept by his brothers. And uh, this was, I mean, Dr. Johnson did such a beautiful job of giving you context for this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush through this story uh, quickly, and you'll hear some pieces of it that she, she has shared. Uh, Joseph's brothers kept a shameful secret long enough for Joseph to grow from a teenager into a man. The story around the secret runs from chapters 37 through 50 in Genesis. So stay alert. We're going to go quickly. These 13 chapters describe how Joseph was father's, his father's favorite among all the 12 sons he had. And uh, this was a joy for Joseph and uh, very discouraging for his brothers. And then 
Joseph added on top of that his interpretation of dreams, and one in particular in which he saw his brothers, he interpreted as his brothers bowing down to him. And uh, of course, imagine how the enraged they would be by this. He's their little brother. Uh, this chapter, the chapters cover the story of Joseph being sold by his brothers, taken and resold to be in service in Pharaoh's palace. We read of his brothers report to their father that Joseph had been killed, presenting to him blood-stained evidence. Joseph's success in service in Pharaoh's palace, his unjustified imprisonment for being accused for attempted rape are part of the story. Success follows Joseph even into prison. <laughs> He's put in charge of the prison after a while. Uh, but they, they bring him back into uh, Pharaoh's presence and, and, and have it, uh, the effect of his being placed in charge of just about everything in the kingdom, only second, second only to Pharaoh. With his dream interpreting gift from God and his management position provided by Pharaoh, Joseph oversees the whole of Egypt's and even Egypt's neighbors' survival through a seven-year drought. At this time, all this time, Joseph has been the secret his brothers have kept from their father. And that can't have been easy for them. In the midst of the drought, Joseph's father, in desperation, sends 10 of his sons with money to buy grain from Egypt's great store. Grain available, by the way, because of Joseph's dreams, and dream interpretations, foresight, and management skills. Joseph immediately recognizes his brothers and notes the absence of his youngest sibling, Benjamin. His brothers, however, do not recognize him, assuming, I'm supposing, that he's either dead or enslaved somewhere. And there, right before them, revealed, uh, when, when Joseph finally reveals himself, the brothers have to be a little worried. Here's the brother they tried to get rid of, or they thought they'd gotten rid of. Here he is right there before them, in a position of extraordinary power. And yet, under the circumstances, Joseph's response to them is quite remarkable. Then Joseph said to his brother, come closer. And they came closer. And then Joseph said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not be distressed or angry with yourself that you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. God sent me here before you to preserve for you a remnant on the earth, to keep alive for you many survivors. So you see, it was not you who sent me here. It was God. And years later, after their father's death and after his brothers, once more filled with fear, offer themselves to Joseph as slaves, and he says to them, you planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it in order to save the lives of many people. God had been able to work with what they had done to him and bring out of it good for all. Joseph could have remained silent, remained a secret, and still given grain to help his family and the people of Israel to survive. But by choosing to reveal himself, he opened the possibility for healing and reconciliation. How did Joseph come to this incredible place of awareness, grace, and forgiveness. It was because of his perspective on God's grace working through him. Joseph realized he was a recipient of the unbelievable, immeasurable love and grace of God. Through this awareness and realization, he knew 
he could move toward hope and reconciliation. We are not so different from Joseph. We too have received the same unbelievably rich blessings of God and uh, of love and grace from God. Here we are with churches everywhere, everywhere full of shameful secrets. So we focus so far on individuals' secrets, but churches also have secrets. And you, some of you know that. You've met that. What keeps us from offering unbound forgiveness like Joseph offered his brothers? What keeps us from offering unrestrained welcome and forgiveness like the prodigal son's father did? What keeps us from offering those bound by shameful secrets a place right here among us, a place filled with love and grace? I think it is simply a matter of fear. People come into our presence with fear, and we greet them with fear. No secrets are revealed. We have to get past that fear. We have to find ways to believe that we have what we need, God's love and grace, and have to trust enough to pass it on. I want to make two suggestions, and I'll quit after that, um, to open, uh, for making ourselves open to receive secrets. The first is opening doors for people to speak, and the second is telling people that we see them. These approaches rely on our availability to hear and to see with courage. And this is possible when we know we've been given the love and grace that we need. Opening doors and saying we see someone can occur through ordinary acts of ministry. All of us who want to encourage the telling of secrets need to demonstrate our availability and offer hospitality. What I mean is to live in a way that conveys openness to others. After we consider the two ways we're making telling possible, I'm just going to say, you know, uh, what one does when one hears a painful secret. First, how do we tell, help people tell? Opening doors. A pastor who had served a present appointment for several years decided to offer a series of classes on human sexuality for adults. The class sessions included about a dozen people ranging in age from their 20s up to some in their 70s and 80s. The discussions were lively and ranged widely. Following the third and final session, while participants were leaving the fellowship hall, Shirley came up to the pastor. Shirley was one of the quieter women who participated in the class. Uh, she approached the pastor and then said something spoken more often than we would expect and to which we should always alert our listening. This is a, a, this is a door for us into sacred listening space. Maybe you've said it to someone yourselves. Maybe some of you uh, have heard it, others say this. Shirley said, I've never told anyone this before. Now, reflect on how, what's your reaction. Imagine yourself, pastor standing there, parishioner saying to you, I've never told anyone this before. Um, maybe you've already shifted into disbelief. Maybe you immediately think and want to respond with, well, are you sure? Are you really sure you want to tell me this now? Um, which I've heard pastors have done, so don't deny it. Um, her, pastor, her pastor listened. Shirley went on to tell her experience. When she was a preteen with her breasts just beginning to develop, she had been taken into a neighbor's barn by some older boys and felt up. Some of you know what that means. Uh, they didn't hurt her physically, but her, the experience terrorized her. Deep in her memory was still the experience of the many times after that when she saw the same boys in town and they made fun of her and laughed at her. As she continued to talk with the pastor, her first female pastor, she reflected that the experience she described was probably why she never married. After that, I could never trust men. Now, I know some of you are thinking, why did she make such a big deal out of it? When we receive something like that, we have to take it where the person experiences it. 
not where we think they ought to experience it. Her experience, kept secret for over 50 years, had deeply affected Shirley's life, including her self-esteem and her relationships. This experience is an example of enabling someone to speak, opening a door for someone to share a secret. The pastor did not know that the class series would open a door for Shirley, and yet it did. The pastor had no idea Shirley even had a secret. This can be a common experience with parishioners. We never know when something we say or do will open a door on a long-kept secret. Well, that ought to keep us quiet. Opening a door comes when, we, when with an action or words, people experience welcome for what can now be spoken. Through a scripture read, a sermon preached, a class taught, a public prayer, all can func function to open doors for someone to share. It is most likely that we don't even know when a secret is there. Door opening, however, is very unlikely when we avoid mentioning sensitive issues in our ministries, issues like sex or domestic violence. It takes courage to raise undesirable issues, even in a prayer. Over years of ministry, I've come to realize the words spoken by many different people are hauntingly similar. Many people carrying shameful secrets introduce their secrets much like Shirley did. I never told this to anyone before. And as I say this, they open up, they, oh, they hope for acceptance where they have feared judgment. I expect that the act of moving toward telling does not occur without the presence of hope. Here's another way we can invite secrets to be confessed. One pastor described an incident in her church in which a parishioner, Henry, exhibited excessive anger toward a new church employee in front of many attendees at a special church event. Uh, the pastor felt the anger was way off the chart, uh, totally uncalled for. She did not understand where all the anger came from. It didn't make sense. At the time, she merely offered uh, Henry some reassurance and calmed the situation. The pastor waited a few days, and when she saw Henry, some, um, when she saw Henry again, she merely said, "Henry, I noticed you were angry last Friday." Henry, I noticed you were angry last Friday. Full stop. This is an example of an I see you comment. Then the pastor listened. Henry responded by telling the pastor how seeing the unfamiliar church employee in a dark hallway had frightened him. The circumstances reminded him of threatening experiences he had had when he was growing up in a dangerous city where he had felt constantly afraid. Maybe you think of PTSD at this point. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and that's very appropriate because that's probably what Henry was experiencing what could you have asked Henry that would have led him to give you this information um, the pastor uh, didn't need didn't have to bring up the incident when she saw Henry and after she did it was still up to Henry to tell the pastor what had gone on are not to tell the pastor. The pastor's role was not to push him or presume to know what had uh, caused his anger, but to receive what he had to say, when he chose to say it, how he chose to say it. The I see you comment from the pastor contained no judgment, no questions. It was only, I saw your feelings, period. The response paved a way for healing. Henry's last words in the conversation with the pastor at that time were said with both relief and commitment. I hope to never act that way again. It sounds like Henry's experience was one of hoping for acceptance and where he might have feared judgment. We can see the hope possible just ahead of Henry. Somehow we have to communicate that we are and then actually be people who are able to receive whatever, whatever can be said. 
Who are we that we should be able to welcome what is usually unwelcome? That is what we are called to do. This is a matter, especially for pastors, a, a matter of communicating availability, which is so difficult when there's so many demands on pastors. You feel that, oh, I've got to do, I've got to do this, I've got to, and, and here is somebody you want to be available to. You have to be able to communicate that. The answer to the question of when we, when, what, what to do when we hear a secret is found right in the grace of God, which is the key that makes it all, that makes it all possible, our hearing, our seeing, and our responding. What we do is receive and welcome what is said, continuing to love the speaker and embody, embody the reality of God's grace to them. We are the people who can be open and able to receive what is said because we, have, uh, we all have what Joseph had and what the father and the prodigal son story had. God's grace and love bestowed on us and ready at hand for us to channel into our relating to others. An incredible, immeasurable gift. Wouldn't you say? We have been given what we need to be able to receive whatever secrets people carry. We have it. We have it. And to do that over and over and over again. Dr. Justice, thank you so much for giving us a glimpse into your research, your writing, your teaching, and your theology of God's grace and love for everyone. It is, it is truly a joy to know that this is the embodiment of the kind of teaching that our students and the future pastors of the church experience in the classroom. So will you join me in thanking Dr. Justice once again. Welcome again to those of you who are new at United, as well as those who are returning and those who are here all the time. It is a joyful thing to be here. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen? Amen. We do not take for granted that we are here, for many are not. We have traveled in cars, by plane, from across this great and beautiful continent to come to this place in response to God's call. Many did not, not because they didn't want to, but because, for a variety of reasons, it was not a possibility for them. There are those who are not here who would give anything to be here with us. These include persons in this country and around the world who, for one reason or another, do not have access to the resources that would allow them to be here. In the case of our Sierra Leone students, it is directly because of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Let us pause to remember and pray for these, our brothers and our sisters who live day and night in fear, in fear of all kinds of things, including contagion from disease and death. Here at United, we fully expect to have access to our books, the internet, our wonderful professors, our wonderful staff, to the teaching of the historic Christian faith, spiritual formation as the body of Christ, in abundance, along with experiencing together and learning about the practices of holiness. We are here at United because we are blessed with a God-given vision of what is possible not only for us, but for the whole world. 
for what we are called to be about, God helping us. I invite you and us together and all those who witness and share what United Theological Seminary is all about. Remember the vision that drives the mission, the purpose, the classrooms, the teaching, the learning, everything we're about here at United. I want to welcome you once again into this vision that is shared by the entire United community throughout space, around the world, and through time as we prepare to open officially the 144th year of ministry of this theological school. I invite you to close your eyes if you want to, if it helps, and imagine for the first time or once again what this vision means for you, for me, for all of us together, but mostly for the whole world, the world that God loves so much. It is an audacious, bold vision, one that some would even scorn and say, well, that's ridiculous. But it's one God has given us, big enough to give hope to the whole world because it is built upon nothing less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the vision of United Theological Seminary that we share, and I quote, United shall be recognized by the global church and the local community as a dynamic community of Christian faith, education, worship, and spiritual growth that prepares excellent clergy and lay leaders for Christian ministry, mission, and renewal. United will produce leaders for the worldwide church. These leaders will work for the salvation of people of all ages, nations, and races by introducing them to Jesus Christ and nurturing their spiritual growth. Our leaders will work for local and global communities that shall be just societies supporting all people in a manner consistent with the teaching and example of Jesus Christ. Can you see it? What is your part in this vision, in this picture? Thank you. Thank you for who you are, for bringing your gifts, whatever they may be, your gifts and your graces, to the altar of Jesus Christ, and for embracing with us a godly vision of what ought to be and what can be in God's world. For there's nothing better, nothing more important, and nothing more exciting in all God's world. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God. Amen. Dean Watson. Good morning, and uh, it is my privilege to welcome you as academic dean to this 2014-15 academic year. As it is my privilege to serve as the academic dean of this fine institution and to work with these fine faculty colleagues who are remarkable people, every one of them people of rich and deep Christian faith. Amen. At United, um, we front three main commitments. The historic Christian faith, the cultivation of holiness, and the renewal of the church. The historic Christian faith means that we regard what has been handed on to us, the faith once passed down to us by the fathers and mothers of the faith to be reliable, powerful ports of entry into the life of God. And it is by entering into the life of God that we achieve the cultivation of holiness. Holiness means that God forms us into the people that we're meant to be. 
And then finally, the renewal of the church. We believe that all renewal, whether of individuals, churches, or the church universal, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And we don't have one answer that we're pushing to this. But rather, we want to open up a vital conversation between pastors and students and church leaders about what God is doing in the world right now and the ways in which we can come alongside the work of the Holy Spirit for the renewal of the church in faithfulness to God. I'm glad you're here today, and I'm glad you've made a decision to come to United Theological Seminary. God's doing some wonderful things here. So welcome, and may God bless us during this 2014-15 academic year. At uh, this time, if our ushers could come forward for our special offering. Friends, this special offering is for our Sierra Leonean brothers and sisters, the people of West Africa who have been stricken with Ebola and will be directed to the relief effort through the United Methodist Committee on Relief and into the office of Bishop John, John Yambasu, who is the point person for distributing that in the annual conference, the Sierra Leonean annual conference. United Seminary has currently contributed $3,000 and is challenging the community here today to match or surpass this level of giving in the offering. All of our hearts are concerned as we have a dear partnership with our friends in Sierra Leone. Four of our students attend here at United. The 2014 Ebola outbreak is one of the largest Ebola outbreaks in the history of uh, West Africa and in the world. The deadly Ebola epidemic raging across Africa currently shows no signs of abating with over 4,000 cases reported and over 2,200 deaths across five countries. The World Health Organization predicts there'll be 20,000 cases and, another, and, and in another six months it's gonna take for um, the resources to gather together in Africa and stabilize things. I know currently I spoke with Joseph Pormai, one of our friends in Sierra Leone, and he said that the whole country had a three, is currently in a three-day quarantine. They didn't have church even yesterday as they had to remain in their homes to try to discern and isolate the disease. So far the outbreak has hit Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria, and the first outbreak in Senegal uh, happened this month. The World Health Organization, the Sierra Leone Ministry of Health, the CDC, and other international organizations are currently working tirelessly to address the crisis. The greatest need right now is around proper medical treatment and properly clothed, equipped, and paid health care workers. The offering is, is already on its way, but at this time, let us bow our heads in prayer, shall we? God of mercy and compassion, hear our cries for the people of West Africa in their time of crisis, in their time of suffering. Extend your hands of healing upon those who have been afflicted. Awaken the world's compassion and their sense of urgency, as well as our own, to respond with resources prayer, and all that is needed to combat this deadly disease. Unite our efforts, direct our responses, and, O oh Lord God, work a miracle among the stricken in West Africa at this time. In Jesus' name, Lord, hear our prayer. Complain about the things of life, and I guess I've been as guilty as the rest, making mountains out of molehills and heartache out of joy, not thinking of the one who knows. 
what's best. He climbed a hill for a sinner like me and gave his life a place called Calvary. Bright angels up above were so As he watched the king of love lay down his crown to save and when my eyes search his misery and woe my heart grows faint to think God loved me so if ever my star should turn from thee. Lord, guide me swiftly to a place called Calvary. And when my eyes search his misery and woe, my heart grows faint to think God if e'er my stubborn will should turn from thee, Lord, guide me swiftly to a place called Calvary. Thank you so much, Jeremy and Fred, for this wonderful ministry of music. And now I invite you, I invite us to prepare our hearts for prayer in the form of a litany of our shared life and ministry at United Seminary. Will you join us in prayer? Holy God, holy and mighty, holy, immortable one. Holy Trinity, one God. We pray to you, Lord Christ. Lord, hear our prayer. For the holy church of God, that it may be filled with truth and love, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear, hear our, our prayer. For all members of your church and their vocation and ministry, that they may serve you in truth and godly life, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For all who fear God and believe in you, Lord Christ, that our divisions may cease and we be one, as you and the Father are one, Lord. we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the mission of the church, that in faithful witness it may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For United Theological Seminary, that it may be a lovely center for sound learning and holy wisdom, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the members of the seminary community, that they may advance in faith, hope, and love as they seek to put on the mind of Christ, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. For those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity of all, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For a blessing upon all human labor and for the right use of the riches of creation, that the world may be freed from poverty, famine, and disaster, 
we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, the persecuted, the sick, and all who suffer. For refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger. That they may be relieved and protected, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. To you, O Lord, our God. Let us pray for the coming of God's rule as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I ask you please to stand. As together, with great joy, we celebrate the opening of the 144th academic year of United Theological Seminary, continuing the ministry of Bone Break Theological Seminary, Evangelical School of Theology, and Union Biblical Seminary. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 I invite the students, please, to be seated and in a spirit of prayer for the dismissal and blessing and recessional. Thank you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Amen. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.